Um, so we are we are so pleased to have you with us today, um, and we are hosting this program. Um, in partnership with the Friends of Olmsted Beale House. Um, my name is Cindy Vandenbosch and I'm here from Turnstile Tours. Um, if you're not familiar with Turnstile Tours, um, we are an organization that works in partnership with different nonprofit organizations, really to build their capacity to welcome the public and to share their stories. And our mission as a social enterprise company that does both tours and virtual programs is, is uh, really focused on um, advancing public knowledge about the meaning of place, connecting people of diverse backgrounds, and inspiring uh, a culture of community participation. Um, so for those of you that um, have, have not kind of uh, learned about our, our programs before, we uh, have a partnership with the Prospect Park Alliance and uh, this is a, uh, we've been doing tours of Prospect Park now for several years and have a true love um, for Frederick Law Olmsted and, uh, the, and, and Olmsted and Vox and their design of that site. Um, and so we hope um, that uh, you'll also come and join us on, on one of our tour programs. What I'd like to do is actually uh, go live out to my colleague, Andrew, uh, who is uh, at, He's on Staten Island, and uh, and we're going to kind of get a little bit of an introduction to the actual program. So, Andrew, uh, welcome welcome to the program. Great, yeah. So I'm here. I'm uh, standing in front of the uh, Olmsted Beale House, and that's Pat Salmon right here, uh, who's going to be uh, sharing um, the site with us and walking around with us in, in just a few minutes. So we really encourage. Uh, your uh, your questions and, and your engagement because we have some uh, really uh, amazing um, guests who are on today and I just want to give a big thanks uh, to the friends of the Olmsted Beal House for uh, uh, helping us put together this this really uh, amazing uh, program tonight. Um, so I just wanted to mention who our other guests are going to be um, and uh, how how tonight's program is going to work. So we're presenting this program um, as uh, part of an ongoing celebration of Frederick Law Olmsted's life, um, which is put on by the uh, National Association for Olmsted Parks. Um, so the Olmsted, it's called the Olmsted 200 celebration. So we encourage you to go uh, to their website, olmsted200.org, uh, where you can um, see all sorts of events related to Olmsted Parks all across the country. Uh, and they have virtual programs and in-person programs. So uh, you can most definitely find an Olmsted Park uh, no, almost no matter where you live in the United States. Um, so, so check that out um, and also check out their, their map of, uh, of Olmsted Parks as well. Um, so th this is, uh, th these are our partners for, for the program tonight. Um, so who's actually gonna be joining us? Um, well, in just a minute, uh, we are going to um, hear from Eileen Monreale, who is the president of the Friends of Olmsted Beale House is gonna tell us um, about what the organization is, what it does, um, and what the future holds for this really, really incredible site. Uh, then we're so lucky to have uh, one of the uh, Friends of the Olmsted Beale House uh, board members, uh, Justin Martin, who also just happens happened to write uh, one of Cindy and my uh, favorite books, uh, Genius of Place, um, which is a biography of Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, in just a, uh, uh, in the second half of the program, we're going to take a little walking tour around the grounds here uh, with Pat Salmon, who's also a board member uh, and uh, an eminent uh, historian of, of Staten Island. Um, and then yeah, that's me and, and Cindy <laughs> will just be uh, kind of facilitating um, tonight, uh, bringing your questions to our really, really uh, knowledgeable guests um, and hopefully uh, this will inspire you to support this great organization, to learn more about it, uh, learn more about uh, Olmsted, uh, and maybe visit an Olmsted park if uh, Staten Island is, uh, is not in your neck of the woods. Um, so uh, now I'd like to turn it over to, to Eileen, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit more uh, about the organization. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm Eileen Monreale president of Friends of Olmsted Beale House. As Andrew said, we're a nonprofit group with an all volunteer board made up of passionate community members dedicated to our mission to preserve, protect, and present the Olmsted Beale historic site. Our current priorities are to advocate for funding to restore the Olmsted Beale farmhouse 
and to increase public awareness of Frederick Law Olmsted, the house, and the many residents that lived in the house from 1685 until uh, most recently when 2006, when the Beals lived in the house. We await the day that the doors of the house can be swung open, school groups can visit, and we can see children coming in and out uh, on a regular basis, that we can host events and provide learning opportunities in this most beautiful and most important landscape. The, this particular event tonight really perfectly aligns with our goals. I want to thank the National Association for Olmsted Parks, NAOP, for their work and support of our efforts, as well as the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, because this house is in a New York City park. This is a really exciting time for us as we celebrate Olmsted 200. As part of NAOP's Olmsted 200 celebrations, we're planning lectures, children's events, tours, and a really fantastic birthday party for Frederick Law Olmsted next year. It would have been his 200th birthday. Please do follow us on our um, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Please check out our website, olmsteadbealhouse.org. Uh, in fact, you can add yourself to receive our free newsletter right from the homepage. And we have really great uh, information. So please take a look and, and learn about our happenings. And tonight we are thrilled and honored to collaborate with Turnstile Tours. We are really grateful for the opportunity to introduce more people to and share the history of this important and enchanting site. So now I look forward to hearing from Justin Martin, author of Genius of Place, The Life of Frederick Law Olmsted. Take it away, Justin. Well, thank you very much, Eileen, and it's great to be here. Um, you got you got a peek at the house, um, and now I'm I'm going to tell you a little bit about its most famous resident, Frederick Law Olmsted. And um, when I speak tonight, one of the main things you should know, one of the main things I'm going to kind of emphasize is he was very much a late bloomer. Uh, he bounced around. He tried a lot of different things before he settled into the profession for which he is best known. I'm also going to concentrate a lot, kind of give a focus to the time he spent on Staten Island. One thing about Olmsted was nothing was ever wasted with him. All the various experiences he had, he brought them to bear. And that's why when he finally did fall into the profession for which he's so well remembered, landscape architecture, he drew on all those earlier experiences, um, including being a farmer on Staten Island. So let's begin at the beginning. Um, Olmsted was born in 1822. He was born in Hartford, Connecticut. This is a monument that actually exists in downtown, still there in downtown Hartford. If you look about the middle of the monument, you can see the names of some Olmsteads. Those were forebears of his who were instrumental in founding the community. And Olmsted was born into pretty prosperous circumstances. His father was a very well-to-do dry goods clerk. Now, one of the things that Olmsted would most remember about his upbringing was his family was in the habit of going out into the countryside that surrounded Hartford and they take these horseback rides. Olmsted was a little guy, he'd ride on the saddle right in front of his father. And the thing that Olmsted would most remember is that for hours on end, the family would ride through the countryside, not speaking a word in just completely silent reverence of nature. That's something that really stuck with Olmsted. Now when Olmsted was 14 years old, he dropped out of school. That's not unusual in this particular era, but it did mean he was going to have to find some kind of useful profession. First thing he lit up on was becoming a surveyor. That didn't exactly stick. So next he tried moving into New York City and becoming a clerk at a merchant firm. That also didn't take. So then he decided to take a year long sailing voyage to China. That also didn't work out for him. So next he fell into farming and he kind of bounced around a little bit until he found his way to a farm on Staten Island, his father, who has always had a very soft spot for Olmsted, always had a soft spot for him, both emotionally and financially, purchased him 130 acres for $13,000 on the south side of the island. Now, the previous owner of the farm had lived in Manhattan and he'd been a kind of weekend hobby farmer. He'd come out and very unimaginative with this planting scheme. He'd simply planted wheat over and over and over again. Olmsted tried to make much more of a go of it, tried to be more professional. He rotated his crops, he planted lima beans, and corn, and cabbage, peaches, and raspberries. 
Now, this is the very first photograph ever taken of Holmes, and it dates to about the time he's farming on Staten Island. It features Olmsted and four people who are really vital in his life. So you see the guy in the upper right-hand corner who's kind of, he's kind of leaning with his um, head against his hand, kind of a slight smile on his face. That's Olmsted's younger brother, John. And then Olmsted, he's easy to pick out. He's the only person in this photograph not looking at the camera. He's looking off to the side with a kind of dreamy, abstracted expression on his face. Typical Olmsted. And then he's got his arm thrown on the shoulders of a man named Charles Loring Brace, who would be his lifelong friend. Now, when Olmsted moved to Staten Island, by just very fortunate circumstance, two of these people, the people I just mentioned, actually moved at the same time to Manhattan. So his younger brother, John, moved to Manhattan um, to study medicine. And Charles Lorne Brace, the guy staring at you very intently there, he moved to Manhattan to study Union's Theological Seminary. So that meant they were just a quick trip away from Olmsted to visit them. And they in turn would often come out to Staten Island and spend long weekends with Olmsted. Now this is Mary Perkins. Now something you should know about Olmsted was he was an incredibly enthusiastic, exuberant person. He'd get really excited about things. And when he learned that the French King Louis Philippe had abdicated the throne, he became so excited that he just dashed to a nearby farm, didn't even know who lived there. As it turned out, it was a man named Cyril Perkins. Cyril Perkins' granddaughter, who lived with him, was an 18-year-old woman named Mary Perkins. And on that first visit, and subsequently Olmsted got to know her, um, he found that they really hit it off. But to use the modern term, he put her in the friendship zone. Uh, he certainly found that they had a lot to talk about, and yet he didn't see any romantic possibility there. However, Brother John, in the habit of, of visiting frequently from uh, Manhattan, he met Mary, he felt differently, they fell in love and they got married. Now, while farming on Staten Island, Olmsted did not only make agricultural improvements, he also made aesthetic improvements. For example, he changed the car carriage path in the house to follow kind of a more supple course out through the landscape. He moved a barn behind a knoll so it wouldn't block his view. He, he put in an ornamental pond. He also planted a number of sort of signature trees, things like Osage oranges, um, black elm trees, cedars of Lebanon. Now, this represents his very first foray into landscape architecture. He wouldn't have called it that at the time. He, he considered himself a farmer, but it represented his first foray into this. And I guess, you know, where did it come from? It was that upbringing in Connecticut, that appreciation of nature, he brought it here. Now, his neighbors on Staten Island started to take note, including William Henry Vanderbilt, who was fabulously wealthy and had a property in the New Dorp section of Staten Island. He hired Olmsted to make beautifications and improvements to his land. And this represents Olmsted's very first landscape architecture commission. Now, once again, Olmsted didn't think of himself as landscape architect. He was still a farmer, but this was his very first commission. And it also um, represents the beginning of a 50 year association between Olmsted and the Vanderbilt family. Now, also while Olmsted was on Staten Island, in, in, um, he, he um, decided to take a walking tour across England with Charlie Brace, the guy who was staring intently earlier, and his brother, John. And when he returned from that walking tour, Olmsted met, was met with an extremely fortunate circumstance. One of his neighbors on Staten Island was a publisher named George Putnam, very innovative man, one of the first people to publish paperback books the company he found, Putnam's, still exists to this day. Well, he approached Olmsted to see if he'd be interested in writing a book about his recent walking tour across England. Olmsted was certainly game, and he wrote a book called Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. Now, the reviews were lukewarm. The sales were tepid. But Olmsted had now made a kind of incredible transition going from being a surveyor to a clerk to a sailor to a farmer, so now he toe-dipped into writing. And this image I've had up um, for a while here, this is actually a illustration, a sketch Olmsted did while he was making that walking tour, and it would later appear in that book. Now, while Olmsted was on Staten Island, he also made a pilgrimage up to Newburgh, New York, to meet with Andrew Jackson Downing. Now, Andrew Jackson Downing was an eminent tastemaker. You might think of him as sort of almost like the Martha Stewart of his day, but he was a rural Martha Stewart. His area was rural beautification, gracious living on a farm, um, and so forth. In fact, Andrew Jackson Downing is the person that's 
often credited with popularizing the front porch. Many of you might have set foot in or seen a 19th or 18th century house where you just open the door and you're just right there in the yard. Well, Andrew Jackson Downey thought that was very uncivilized. He suggested you need to have a, a transition between the domestic realm inside the house, nature outside the house, and so a front porch would furnish that transition. Well, the reason that Olmsted went up to Newburgh to meet with um, Downing was he was hoping Downing had a kind of a little empire of various publications about gracious country living and Olmsted hoped to get some writing work. Now you see the inset photograph there. Um, that's Calvert Vaux, Andrew Jackson Downing's young English trained architect who was his assistant. And during this meeting, Olmsted met Vaux and it was a very unmemorable meeting, probably nothing more than a handshake. Neither man in future years would remember anything about it. But it was also, given what would happen in the future for these two men, it was a very consequential or meaningful meeting, as you will see. Now, while Olmsted was in Staten Island, another very fortunate um, piece of luck fell his way. Olmsted was one of these people who was always in the right place at the right time. He was hired by a brand new, a startup publication called the New York Times uh, to travel across the American South reporting on slavery. And so in the autumn of 1852, after the harvest was over, because he still was a farmer by trade, Olmsted set off for the South. He went everywhere. He talked to everyone. He produced a spectacular series of 48 dispatches that helped put the brand new New York Times on the map. Now, while Olmsted was traveling to the South, of course, he was morally repulsed by slavery, but for the times, he often also came up with a very novel criticism of slavery on grounds of economic inefficiency. And throughout his Times columns, he was able to make an unfavorable comparison between plantations and his Staten Island farm, which is a model operation employing free labor um, and a model of efficiency. This image I've had up for a while here, this is actually another sketch Olmsted did while on assignment for the New York Times while traveling through the American South. Olmsted was a very um, sort of open-minded correspondent. So while he found slavery morally repugnant, he found the South a place of surpassing beauty. He did this sketch during his travels and it would later appear in a book um, that was a collection of his Southern reportage for the New York Times. So next Olmsted decided to really take the plunge. He decided to move to Manhattan to leave Staten Island, move to Manhattan, and become a writer. But now comes an absolutely cataclysmic event in US economic history. It's known as the crash of 1857. It was a very rapid downward spiral in economic conditions. Olmsted's journalism work dried up. He found himself low on coal. He had holes in his shoes. He owed money to his father and just about everyone he knew. So Olmsted was forced to take a job a very modest job for someone who just traveled across the South on assignment for the New York Times. He took a job in which he was called upon to clear a very scruffy piece of land. It was very prosaically named for its position right in the middle of New York City. It was called Central Park. And Olmsted's job, his very modest job, was simply to clear this piece of land for someone else's design. Enter Calvert Vox, remember him? Well, in the intervening years since that unmemorable meeting between Olmsted and, and, and him, um, his, his, his star had really been on the rise. Um, Andrew Jackson Downing, his boss, sadly had died. Vox had gone out on his own um, and he started his own act architecture practice and been very successful. Now, Vox took a look at the existing plan for Central Park. He was disgusted. He could not believe how amateur it was. And Vox, he had friends in high places. He'd recently designed the Fifth Avenue mansion of one of the board members of the future Central Park. So Vox started approaching the board. I'm just paraphrasing here, but he said, um, this is a really amateur design. I suggest you table it. In England, where I'm from, if you want to get a good design, you have a public competition. Well, the board had listened to Vox. It tabled the existing design, and it opened up a new competition, open to the public, calling for new designs for the park. At this point, Vox sought out, sought out Olmsted to see if Olmsted would like to be his partner for the design competition. Now, Vox couldn't care a bit about the fact that Olmsted had lately been traveling through the South on assignment for the New York Times. That meant nothing to Vox. The reason Vox wanted to be partners with Olmsted was because Olmsted had been out on a scruffy piece of land, knocking down shanties and draining swamps. And Vox perceived that Olmsted literally knew the lay of the land.
So Olmstead and Vox had teamed up for the competition and there were 33 contestants for that design competition. 32 of them produced designs that rate somewhere between a B minus and a flat F. Olmsted and Vox produced an A plus. It was instantly recognized as the design for Central Park. They won the competition hands down. And furthermore, they are hired to execute their, their competition, their, their entry for the park. And I'll give you just one way in which Olmsted and Vox's design was so set apart from their competition. Many of the competitors were just sort of fanciful designs for parks. But Olmsted and Vox, along with a beautiful park design, also brought a lot of pragmatic considerations. And to give just one example, there were very good and modern ideas for drainage. What a boring, homely topic, drainage. But an important topic if you're going to have, uh, an important um, subject if you're going to have a public park. You don't want after there's a heavy rainstorm for there to be water pooling places. And where did Olmsted get this knowledge of drainage? When he was working as a farmer on Staten Island, he apprised himself of all the latest and greatest in drainage technology, and he brought that with him to his park design for Central Park. Now, while Olmsted was working on Central Park, he got married. If you look at the inset photograph, that's his bride, uh, and that was Mary, his brother's widow. Sadly, Olmsted's brother, also while he was working on Central Park, John, had died of tuberculosis. And in a deathbed letter, um, John wrote to Olmsted his very last words, literally the very last words he ever would communicate to his brother in a PS. The PS said, PS, don't let Mary suffer while you're alive. Well, being a dutiful brother, Olmsted married Mary. He adopted the three children that Mary and John had had together and raised them as his own. He and Mary would also have three children of their own. So while um, Central Park was under construction, the Civil War broke out. Most of what Olmsted and Vox wanted to accomplish had been accomplished. What hadn't been done um, was sort of in progress. And so at that point, Olmsted um, joined the Union cause, went down to Washington, D.C., and headed up a medical relief outfit called the United States Sanitary Commission. But Olmsted liked to bounce around a lot. About halfway through the Civil War, he went out to California, and he became the superintendent of a gold mine. This Ugly picture is of the actual homely hill on which Olmsted's gold mine operated. While out in California, he also bounced around Yosemite a little bit. But then in 1865, the Civil War ended. And all of a sudden, there was all this pent up demand for parks to be built. On the eve of the Civil War, Olmsted and Vox had created a masterpiece with Central Park and all these communities around the country. They'd want to have their Central Park. But with the outbreak of the war, they'd had to put their plans on hold. When the war ended, it was like a dam bursting. All these communities started um, rushing to create their parks and the natural people to turn to were Olmsted and Vox. And so at last, at the age of 43, because he had no other choice and because there was this onslaught of offers, Olmsted finally settled into the profession for which he become, um, become famous, landscape architecture. And he and Vox together did a whole series of classic designs across the nation. This is Prospect Park, their sophomore effort after um, Central Park. I love this image, by the way. It's some kind of tree trimming team on a very tall and precarious ladder. While Olmsted worked on Prospect Park, he actually moved back to Staten Island to the Clifton section. That um, allowed him to be kind of close, a close commute, as it were, to um, his project where he's working Prospect Park. Olmsted also designed the Capitol grounds in Washington, D.C. And Olmsted famously designed the grounds of the world, the Chicago World's Fair, known as the White City. But everywhere Olmsted worked, one thing that was a common denominator was he was always drawing his former experiences, including very much on his time as a farmer in Staten Island. And just, and just to give one example, um, Olmsted Parks, one of the things that set them apart was incredibly imaginative arrangements of trees. While in Staten Island, Olmsted had self-taught had made himself an expert on different kinds of trees and how to plant them to get various moods and effects. And so wherever he went, whatever parks he designed, um, Olmsted was always drawing on his previous experiences, um, including that time as a farmer on Staten Island. Now Olmsted's final major project, his swan song, was the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. Now for this, the client was George Washington Vanderbilt, the wealthiest man on earth and the son of William Henry Vanderbilt. 
So working with Vanderbilt represented the culmination of a 50 year association from Olmstead and the Vanderbilt family. He'd done many landscapes for different land, um, family members, such as uh, an estate and on the Newport Cliff Walks. Now, Olmstead had a gigantic canvas to work on. Um, Vanderbilt had bought up 120,000 acres surrounding this gigantic house. Um, and Olmstead told Vanderbilt that he would restore it to its former glory. Once again, this comment actually harkened back to Olmsted's time on Staten Island, because when he went on Staten Island and been on assignment for the New York Times, he had traveled through this very section of North Carolina, and he witnessed um, this um, landscape when it was in a prime, sort of a more primal form um, before it had kind of um, fallen into somewhat disrepair in the years before Vanderbilt purchased it. So when Olmsted said, I'll return it to its former glory, he knew of what he spoke, and he was drawing from experience back when he was a farmer in Staten Island. Now, the inside image there, when Vanderbilt, um, while Olmsted was working on the Biltmore Estate, Vanderbilt hired John Singer Sargent, the great portrait painter, to do a painting of Olmsted. And that portrait still exists. It has kind of pride of place in the great hall of the, Van of, of the Biltmore Estate. So I want to just close by saying that one of the wonderful things, I like to think of Olmsted almost like the Johnny Appleseed of landscapes. One of the wonderful things, I, mean, I think Andrew made reference to it at the beginning is you can't go anywhere in the country without being pretty close to some Olmsted creation. Um, today, you're gonna be getting a, a better, deeper look at the Olmsted Beale House, a, a landscape on, on Staten Island or, or, a, or a, um, a farmhouse and landscape on Staten Island. Thank you very much and enjoy the tour. Thank you, thank you so much um, for sharing sharing those insights, uh, Justin. We really appreciate it. Um, and, and we do have some questions from the audience, and so we'll bring those in um, uh, a little bit towards the end when we do the Q and A. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much. Um, so now, <laughs> now we're going to um, make our way um, to uh, to the grounds of the Olmsted Beal House. Uh, with Andrew, and we're going to do a tour. Um, and so uh, take it away. So um, I am going to turn things over to uh, Pat uh, right now, Pat Salmon, uh, who's an eminent historian here on, on Staten Island. And we're going to take a little walk uh, around the grounds. Um, she's going to tell us a little bit about the history of the house. And you can see kind of the work um, that's been done on the house. And uh, we'll also get to see some of the trees uh, that Justin referenced as well. So, Hi, my name is Pat Salmon. I am a retired curator of history and author and historian about Staten Island. And it's thrilling to be here right now at the former Olmsted farm. Uh, there's cat birds flying around and turkey vultures, the gophers are running all over the place. And it's just thrilling to be in this sacred spot. Um, I wanna start with this Southeast corner of the house right here. It was way back in 1685 that a man by the name of Domini Petrus Tessenmacher created a very small stone shelter. It was stone on three sides, field stones that he gathered from around the property. And the other, the fourth side of, the, of his shelter was in the, just went with the flow of, of, the, of the earth, the way the, 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 the contour of the landscape. And he lived here. He uh, actually used to keep his horse in there with him, we believe too. It was a very, very small stone shelter with a roof. It was about 16 by 16 feet. Now, you know, his, he, he was a domine. What's a domine? He was a reverend of the Dutch Reformed Church. And he was given about um, 130 acres of land by the Royal Colonial Governor, Thomas Dongan. And he was, in addition to being a reverend, he was a farmer. So in exchange for the land, he had to give uh, a bushel of uh, winter wheat every year on March 14th to uh, the, lo the, local, uh, uh, the local administrator, let's say. But while he was doing this and farming this land that's all around us, he was living in this little shelter. Up until the 1950s, we know from a historian who lived in the house at that time, she could still see the outline of a window that existed during this time. It's a very small window. She could also see the outline of a fireplace. And um, 
it's it's just amazing to think about him living in this small shelter because his congregation was actually in a place called Port Richmond. And if you know Staten Island's landscape or you know uh, where places are, Port Richmond is about 10 miles from here. So he had to take care of a congregation that was 10 miles north of here. So he would have to go on horseback to this congregation as needed. But in the meanwhile, he lived here, he, he tilled the land here, and um, he actually had land all the way to the Raritan Bay, which is the south shore of Staten Island. And we, we know that in his time and in later years, it was grand views of the Raritan Bay enjoyed by all of the people who lived here. And that besides the Reverend, there have been some quite phenomenal people residing in this house. So we're just gonna go around to the, the east side of the building right now, and we'll take a look <clears throat> at what was um, done to the structure by people who came in later in later years. So you might be wondering too, what is this uh, shelterish looking thing here? Well, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It is actually to protect the pointing work that was done by professional uh, craftspeople who know how to restore historic buildings. And they repointed the, the stonework that's all around the bottom here, but they put this protective roof over it so that you know the, the, the work that they did would uh, not go for naught, shall we say. So come up this way. And now this is the east side of the Olmsted Beal House. And as I said, the, the, the Domine lived in this little section in the, in the southeast corner. Now we see the Domine having to move up to Schenectady around 1690. It seems he was very skilled at, at understanding the languages of Native Americans. So he was sent up there to um, administer and take care of a congregation that was right on the, you know, on the, on the edge of so-called civilization at this time. And unfortunately, the fort where he was, and the town where he was located, as I said, it was Schenectady, was attacked and he was killed. And um, so he was only in his forties and he was a very young man, unfortunately but he still owned this property. And we're not sure how or why, but we do know that as Jacques Poyan, which is a very old Staten Island family, he was the road commissioner in the 1690s. And he was tasked with building a road from what um, was once called the King's Highway, but now is Amboy Road. He was tasked with building a road into some of this property that was owned by the Domine. Now the congregation, that the Domine had once uh, administered to a Port Richmond, they wanted the property to go to, uh, to help poor people. Somehow Jacques Poyan was able to buy the whole farm from what is still today, the Raritan Bay all the way up to Amboy Road. And he and his two sons and their families lived in this house. How could they live in a little shelter like that? Well, of course they couldn't. So they added this first floor to what was the, what was the Domine shelter. You can see, if you look closely at the house, there are three archways and later historians believe that it's possible that Jacques, along with his two sons, one was, was John Jr. and the other one was James, each had their own separate entrances. You can see the arched bricks. There's three, there's, there were actually three entrances into this house. So the, the Poyons are credited with making the house uh, about 48 feet long, I believe it is. And they built the, 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 the first floor there in the Flemish style. 
So they were here for quite a long time. They lived on this property till about 1802. They were very good at producing uh, fruit and, and growing fruit trees and things of that nature. But uh, by 1802, we see that the family, the Poyan family, is no longer interested in the, in the property. So it was sold to a neighboring farmer by the name of Journier also an old Staten Island family. Now, something we want to point out that is very important, which only came to light recently, to be quite honest, is that both the Journeys and the Poyans had enslaved people living on this property. And uh, uh, we have found records um, from census records. We have, we have found the names of some of these enslaved peoples. So this is a, opens a whole new avenue of historical study for us and, and for subsequent, subsequent researchers. So uh, we do want to point that out, that they also labored on the farm and, and you know, gave their blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak, to, to working on this property. So we see the journey are here. Well, about 1812, a man by the name of Judge Garretson gets the property, he buys the property, and um, he's here until about the 1830s. Judge Garrison was very well known on Staten Island. During the War of 1812, he was in charge of all of the military men from Staten Island. And during his military service, he met a man by the name of uh, Dr. Samuel Ackerley. Now, Ackerley, we don't hear a lot about. He came here about 1836. And Ackerley was amazing. He, he was involved with the Institute for the Deaf. He was involved with the Institute for the Blind, but he, uh, organizations that were in Manhattan, but he loved nature. He loved to study nature. He was an expert on all kinds of things related to nature. So in his retirement years, he thought he would live here and study nature, write his memoirs and things like that. He wasn't a farmer. In fact, the fruit trees that he inherited from uh, the Poyans and the Journeys pretty much went to naught. Um, and uh, the land would, was kind of became very barren under his, uh, his ownership of the property. Now it was Ackerley who added the top floor and then that, that attic floor up on the top as well. You could see where the belly on the floor windows are. And it was him, Dr. Samuel Ackerley, who added that white clapboard up there at the top. There are also many who believe that it was Ackerley who put this Northern addition onto the house. And the Northern addition is actually the kitchen. So it was Ackerley who added the kitchen to the property. Now, um, he was also the man who put a porch around the house because he believed that the, when he put the extra floors on that the house looked very awkward. So he thought if he put the porch on, it would sort of offset things. So this was the property that our, our hero, Frederick Law Olmsted came to own and came to live on in 1848. And it's been pointed out to me that if we take a look at this, this roadway here, this carriage lane, so to speak, it, it is, it is uh, very Olmstead-like in that it, it curves and comes up and it goes behind the house. And so, you know, you're, so you're left with a feeling of wondering what's coming at you. Much the same as he did at the, at the Vanderbilt Mausoleum uh, at the Vanderbilt Cemetery here on Staten Island. So Olmstead arrives in 1848, and I won't delve too much into it, but Justin gave us a wonderful background of his years on Staten Island. But it was uh, while he was living here, being a farmer, that he took that fateful trip to England. And he ordered uh, some, I think it was 500 trees and shrubs to be brought back and sent to this farm here. And of course, um, there were 200 extra samples put into this order that he, he had sent from Europe. And he found that there were these two magnificent trees, uh, that two, there were, there were several of these magnificent cedar of Lebanon. Of course, they were just little saplings when he planted them in 1850, but look at them now. I mean, they're, they're 
amazing. They're 170 years old and they don't grow in this climate. This is so unusual. And yet these, these two have survived and thrived and we're still able to look at them, enjoy them and be amazed because they're from the Holy Land. That's why they're, they're called Cedars of Lebanon. So uh, we, and there, there really are, there was one other that grew in the New York City area back in the thirties. And I'm not sure if it's still around, but these, these two are amazing. Now, also in this uh, order that uh, Mr. Olmsted got, there were other trees that are still visible today and still thriving here today. And if we take a look over here, straight ahead, this curving sort of a tree, that is called an Osage orange tree, orange tree. And they're not very common also here in the New York City area or in the East. They generally grow out West and they were used as, um, like hedgerows and things like that. It's beautiful wood though. Um, if we can even get up close to it, you see beautiful orange wood. I, uh, it's supposed to be very resilient and, and the cattle didn't like to eat it out west. So that's one of the reasons why it was planted in later years. But this tree was actually planted by Olmsted. And, um, you know, just, I mean, look at it. And all around us, there are uh, offshoots of this tree. Um, dozens of them, as a matter of fact, and, and it, look at the unique bark. And I mean, if you were to see this with snow on it, I mean, it all practically brings tears to your eyes that the beauty of it uh, is, is just amazing. And these trees are easy to recognize in the fall, right? Because oh, root. well, with the Osage, yes, the Osage orange tree has like a they, some people call it monkey brain and it's, it's about this big and it looks like a brain. Uh, really hard, uh, hard thing. Uh, even the wildlife's not too big on it, but our friend Tina Kasman Dunn, who's also on the board, she, she kind of cuts them up for the, for the wildlife to eat and, and things like that, but very, very unique fruit, absolutely. Now, if you take a look at this gem over here, this is a black walnut tree, and it too was planted by Mr. Olmsted. And you know, a walnut is, you know, a premium wood, and um, you know, it just—you can see just by looking at it how it thrives. And it too has a a wonderful uh, nut, the walnut that we all know. And of course, if you if you cut it open or break it open, it has like a black inky inky uh, substance inside of it. But he also planted ginkgo trees, ginkgo biloba on that, uh, here on the farm and it still thrives. He planted a horse chestnut tree over here and, and it is still thriving. It flowers and uh, amazing, just, just amazing. Uh, he planted mulberry trees, he planted magnolia trees, but he was also, uh, prior to that, he was also successfully raising uh, fruit trees, especially apples and pear trees. And he, you know, he was, he was also growing some wheat too, and he was quite successful at it. Now, um, as Justin was saying, eventually he left uh, Staten Island, it was 1855, his brother, uh, took over ownership of the house. And we see the Olmsted still own the property up to at least 1866. Uh, John is dead by then, but on the maps of Staten Island, you could see that it's still in the Olmsted family. By 1871, there is a, 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 a Dr. Anderson who owns the farm, the big property. And he does not live here. He lives in a community known as Stapleton on the east shore of Staten Island. But interestingly, he's a physician and he started his uh, medical career at the Siemens Retreat, a hospital for sailors who were injured or sick. And in later years, he was a commissioner for the quarantine, which uh, when ill or, or sick immigrants came into the country, they went to this quarantine station. He was a commissioner there. Anyway, all of this to say, this property, this farm that he bought, he was raising specialized crops in order to uh, feed 
these all these patients that he had or all these sick people that you know uh, were in the facilities that he was uh, working for and um, that's what this property was used we haven't been able to determine what these specialized products were what these produce what this produce was but you know there's a, there's a lot more to learn Perhaps one of the most interesting people who owned the property and he took it over in around 1885 was a man by the name of Erastus Wyman. Erastus Wyman was a, a booster on Staten Island. He got involved with rail service. He got involved with ferry service. He established the ferry run from St. George to Whitehall. Well, he bought this big farm and he was using this building as a bed and breakfast. It was uh, called the Woods of Arden Inn. And he outfitted it, uh, the interior for like fishing parties. He um, had all kinds of paths and walkways developed uh, throughout the property. He had boats by the waterfront where people could, you know, go into the boats or as part of, a, you know, staying here at the resort. Uh, they could, you know, rent fishing poles. They could go bathing, as they say, into the water. And he dubbed it, as I said, the Woods of Arden. And that comes from Shakespeare's play, As You Like It. And so there are so many interesting connections here between the Woods of Arden Inn and uh, cultural things and uh, recreational things. For instance, they used to play croquet out here on the lawn and they would have uh, put on plays and concerts and things like that. And so, uh, you know, recreationally, it was, it was, a, it, it was, it was quite, quite a sight. Now, Lyman had big grand ideas and this was just one of several. He had uh, the New York, first New York Metropolitans playing pro baseball in St. George section of Staten Island. He had Buffalo Bills Wild West show out on the North Shore at a place called Aristina, which was the border of Elm Park and Marinus Harbor. Sitting Bull was part, part of the show. Annie Oakley was part of the show and they'd, they put on, you know, recreations of battles out West uh, between the Native Americans and then, and the, the United States military. It was a big production. Everything Erastus did was big, big, big. Well, unfortunately, Erastus had some financial problems. He had some legal problems. So we see by 1898 that this whole property is, is under, uh, in trust, shall we say, for the creditors of Erastus Wyman. And he never recovers from all these pr problems that he has. So by 1902, a man by the name of John Hales buys the property. It's already starting to be cut down into, you know, smaller parcels and smaller parcels. Well, Hales buys it. And he starts to build houses on what is now Highland Boulevard. And they really were beautiful houses in, in all kinds of styles. Uh, we have one that's a, like a Swiss chalet. We have one uh, or two that are in Tudor styles. And they were very well built houses. As a matter of fact, Hales lived himself um, on what would become um, Highland Boulevard. And his company was called Seaside Estates. And we see that Seaside Estates owns what is now the Olmsted Beale House until around 1946. And at that time, Margaret and John Cullen buy the property. And if you remember, I said a few minutes ago, there was a historian who lived here in the 1950s. It was Margaret Boyle Cullen. And she loved this house so much so that she did magnificent research on the history of the house. And it was published in a three part series by the Staten Island Historical Society in the early 1950s. Wonderful article. She goes right from uh, the Domine Tessemacher all the way up to her you know, time living in this house. In fact, we recently heard from her granddaughter, Nina Ritson, who sent us these magnificent pictures of, of uh, Margaret and John and their family and friends sitting on the porch on a summer's evening and having a couple of drinks and talking and beautiful, beautiful pictures. Well, 
1955, Carlton and Louise Beal bought what was left of the property and they bought the house. And the property was about an acre and a half by this time. Carlton was one of Staten Island's premier naturalists. He uh, started at the Staten Island Museum uh, working, uh, not working, he was learning from the best of the best, Mr. William T. Davis, Carol Stryker. And he eventually, you know, went from the Staten Island Museum to the American Museum of Natural History. Well, it was always Carlton's and Louise's dream that this house be preserved. They understood you know, the importance of Mr. Olmsted and, and Dr. Ackerley and, and uh, Erastus Wyman, and, and, and they wanted to see this land preserved. So they always uh, stressed to their children, Felicity Beal, uh, Carlotta Beal DeFeo, and uh, Eloise Beal, that the house had to be preserved and to please, you know, make sure New York City Parks takes it over. I mean, this was like sacred ground to them. Yeah, I mean, the, the daughters learned all about nature. They learned all about history. And for that reason, the three of them all have had careers at, at various uh, museums, the uh, Staten Island Historical Society, Manhattan Children's Museum, the Shelburne Museum, the list goes on. But it was them that facilitated this house being preserved and becoming a New York City park. It was also Carlton and Louise who worked so hard to um, get this house landmarked back around 1967 or so. Because if anybody's familiar with Staten Island, we have really seen nothing but uh, destruction and overdevelopment and things of that nature. So to have a, a gem like this preserved and, and open to the public is, is, is really quite a magnificent thing. Thank you so much, Pat. That, that was amazing. So, Cindy, I'll, I'll kick it over to you and the rest of our guests, because I know we have a lot of questions that have come in, and, and uh, we want to uh, make sure we get to as, as many of them as, as we can. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, so if we can enjoy, uh, oh, thank you so much uh, for such a wonderful tour. Pat, I wanted to ask, there are several people asking in the chat whether they can actually come visit, uh, visit the grounds and do a tour uh, and 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 do that anytime soon. Well, the the grounds are open to the public, sunrise to sunset. It is a New York City park. Unfortunately, we nobody can get into the building at this time uh, for safety reasons, and it needs to be restored and all of that. Now, this is a great time to plug the fact that we're having a cleanup on Sunday from nine a.m. to one p.m. And the really eminent historian, Tina Kasman Dunn, is in charge of the cleanup, and she just loves talking about this house. So if you come for the cleanup, um, and even if you don't clean up the property of the grounds, she'd love to show you around, tell you different things. But you can also visit our Facebook page. We're on Instagram. We are on Twitter. We have a website, um, homesteadbealhouse.org, I think it is. Um, but you can learn more about the house at, at those uh, locations. And That's wonderful. We, so, Saturday, right? we have a very big event on Saturday, uh, our Fred, Frederick Law Olmsted Green Day Neighbor. It's at the Biddle House, which is part of Conference House Park. And it's a wonderful opportunity for kids to learn all about nature and nature crafts and learn about Mr. Olmsted and all that he did while he was living here and what he went on to do in his life. So highly recommend that event, it's a free event, go, go for it. Go to the Facebook page, you'll see post about it for details. Uh, go to our website for details, send us an email if you want. Um, I, you can reach us at info at olmsteadbealhouse.org. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, and now we've brought Eileen as well as Justin uh, back onto the panel so that we can uh, respond to some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, so thank, thank you all um, for such interesting context about Frederick Law Olmsted's life and also for all the preservation work uh, that you're doing, and, and of course, Justin, uh, the incredible research that you did for your book. 
Um, so there is one really basic question. This actually isn't about Olmsted, it's about Vox. <laughs> there were a couple people that wondered about the pr pronunciation. Vox's name is spelled V-A-U-X. Why is it not pronounced uh, Vo? And I think I'll bounce this one to Justin. It's pronounced Vox because he was an Englishman of French descent. And as um, people know, the English enjoy tweaking the French by mispronouncing, in fact, sometimes just pronouncing phonetically the way a word should sound. It's sport for English people sometimes. And so my assumption is that um, someone whose relatives were known as Va, um, when he became Vox in England, he became Vox in England. So he was an Englishman of French descent. Uh, so it's so interesting. And that's certainly something I, I learned when I read your book as to why. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a question. So there's a, a question that came in about um, if you had the opportunity to sit down with Frederick Law Olmsted and have a cup of coffee for an hour, what might you want to talk to him about? Um, and maybe we'll start. I, I, I don't know who would like to jump in. Maybe you have a question. You'd have a question you'd want to ask, something you've always been curious about. Would you, would you like me to take a crack sure, at it? it? Sure, sure. Well, I, th I think the thing I would ask him instead is what he thinks uh, is sort of the next frontier for, for landscaping and for, for public grounds. I mean, in his day, thanks to Olmsted, all these sort of central parts of cities, the inner cities, are um, they're greened in this green space because he was for, he was prescient enough in the 19th century, in inner city Milwaukee, inner city Buffalo, inner city New York City, to um, set aside green space before it got filled in. And so by virtue of that, in the middle of cities, you have Olmsted creations. I'd say now that um, now that our development patterns are different, what is the next frontier, and what would you what would you, what would you propose to make our cities more attractive? <laughs> Yeah, he had such vision for his time. That is, that is, uh, it's really interesting. Pat or Eileen, any questions for Olmsted um, that you would have if you sat down with him? I would like to ask him. It was almost innate in these places that he designed that he just drew the visitor in, so that you feel very. Or I, I have felt very warm and welcoming in places like Prospect Park and Central Park, and I've been to the Buffalo Park system. And I would, I would just love to know what brought that out of him that he could do that for the public and for people to to really make it our own spaces. You know, um, it was just a magnificent talent that he had, and I would love to delve into that. And I guess for me, the question might be because I'm just. I know he probably knew he was doing magnificent work, but I guess my question would be, did you ever realize that, um, you know, on your 200th birthday, the whole nation probably beyond the nation would be celebrating you in such a huge way and that you've impacted all of our lives so positively? I would just want to know, like, did he have any idea of what the difference he was really making in the world? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have some questions in the chat about uh, plans for the future for your organization and, and um, also how people can support you. But um, your thoughts on preservation of the house and what, what that might look like in the years to come. Well, we, we have sat down with the Parks Department and uh, they're a great part or, you know, we're, we're very happy to um, collaborate with them, to talk with them, assist them in any way we can. We realize it's a slow process. We just discovered, discussed that at a recent board meeting that we would probably like to have a historic preservationist, people who do this professionally sit down. So we can all really understand that a lot has to go into it. It'll probably take years and mm -hmm. um, a lot of fundraising to get us to where we want to be. But we are obviously so passionate that we are going to get there, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, I, we have a, a question coming in that's, um, what do you think Frederick Law Olmsted would say about um, something like Brooklyn Bridge Park or the High Line or you know, some of these sort of newer, I guess this is sort of speaking to uh, Justin's, Justin's uh, reflections, but um, I don't know, Pat or um, Pat or Eileen, like maybe what he might think of, of those types of parks that we have today. 
Well, I think he would be. An answer, because hey, we, we can't get into his head. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think he'd be thrilled with the High Line. I mean, the, the popularity of it and, and people talking about it and everybody you know is going there, walking on it, taking it in, you know, enjoying the city. Um, I think he'd, he'd be very pleased with, with, with that, with that uh, setup that, that's been created up there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that it's free for everybody. And I think he, he, you know, wanted you to have good, you know, emotional, physical, mental health. And these places continue to um, really provide that for greater and greater numbers of people. And his values were so democratic. I think he would be just delighted to see these parks. Um, would it, you know, when he moved to Staten Island, I don't know, this is a question for Pat or Justin. Um, and in terms of the relationships that he had with his neighbors and connections, I, I know this is something you looked into in the book, Justin, you spoke a bit about, um, uh, you know, what, what kind of, uh, these were sort of formative years for him. Um, and is there anything that you could say about his relationship to his neighbors that would have been really important in his life at this time? I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. The main thing I would say is, is he both met it was very good for him because he both met um, some wealthy future clients like the Vanderbilts, but he also, he was very much of his generation, he was very committed to social justice. And so he was also very concerned about communicating with his fellow farmers, a lot of them illiterate in that era. And so part of his interest in scientific farming, part of the reason he took that walking tour through England was to learn the latest and the best um, practices in farming. Mm -hmm. And then he and with a sort of social justice um, intention, he planned to disseminate information about farming to his neighbors, some of whom were, as I said, they were illiterate farmers in some cases in that era, people, there was much lower literacy. So, so yeah, so he, he, he had a sort of a, a social justice angle that he, that he, that he brought to his, to his endeavors. Uh, he was well, even involved with, with the Richmond County Agricultural Society and served as the secretary. And in his writings, you know, he discussed spreading the latest scientific um, knowledge about improving your farms and improving the, the landscaping and improving the drainage. And, you know, he was, uh, he was very community oriented and, uh, you know, he loved to talk to people too from what I can understand uh, from studying Justin's work and McLaughlin's work and Mr. Dr. Beveridge's work. He, he loved to discuss current events, politics, religion, whatever the topic was. He and his brother John and Charles Loring Brace would, would sit for hours t discussing these things. Very social people, um, unlike we are today where who's looking at their cell phone or who's running to the, the email, you know, uh, they, were, they were very uh, community oriented people. Well, uh, you know, we want to thank, it's, it's uh, already over time, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to participate in this program and share this unique site. And I think all of us who are watching today and who did the tour and, and learned from uh, Eileen, Justin, and Pat, um, we are so excited that you're going to be telling these stories um, from Staten Island during this time um, that was so important in, in his life that sort of launched him off on his career really. Um, and so we, we thank you so much um, for taking the time, not only uh, connecting us to his story, but sharing the work that you're doing. So, you know, with volunteers and fundraising and uh, making an effort uh, to bring this place to life so that you can share these stories uh, of him, whether it's involvement in civic life, the trees that are still there, it's absolutely incredible. Um, they're, mm -hmm. they're beautiful, thank you for sharing those. Um, and and uh, I hope that folks who are watching today will also support uh, the friends of, of Olmstead Beal House and, and the work that you're doing and, and follow you, like you said, on Facebook and on social media, um, donate to support the organization. And there's, there is uh, a family event, right, this uh, this weekend as well? Absolutely, uh, it is, yep. June, June 12th at uh, Biddle House. Look forward to seeing everyone. And thank you so much, Cindy, Andrew, and yeah. the whole team. Yeah. Wonderful. And Justin, you were fabulous. And Pat. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
Bravo, everybody. And thank you to Stefan, Doug, uh, who have been behind the scenes helping with the technical side. Um, uh, we thank you all uh, and, and hope you have a great evening. And, look and before we go, Cindy, yeah. just one thing. I thought we just, if uh, folks, it's, it's been so wonderful standing here. And I know some of the sound has translated mm -hmm. over Zoom, but it's just been so much bird song and every, everything. So if we just take a minute um, as we say our goodbyes, I just wanted to walk people, give one more sort of spin around the property so you can appreciate just how beautiful this is. But thank you all so much for joining us. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. What a beautiful way to end. All right. Good night.